Well, thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here at the Blue Water Symposium. So I'll be uh, talking about the work that I conducted uh, during the course of my PhD, as well as my colleague, Shaha Baig, uh, during the course of his PhD, as we're now both research fellows under Professor Eric Johnson, who was one of the PIs for two of the uh, Great Lakes allocations that we, uh, I'll be presenting on the work on, and also uh, a broadening participation allocation under Professor uh, Shin Su. And what I'm showing you here is really a, a time lapse of volume rendering of of a bubble collapsing and forming a re-entrant jet is colored by temperature. So as you can see, as the bubble begins to co collapse, it's getting hotter and hotter to, to the point that it forms a re-entrant jet and then creates a, a hot vortex ring that then propagates uh, towards a wall here that you don't see that's out of the frame. And so uh, we use blue waters to predict cavitation impact loads. And, and the first question is, what is cavitation? Well, cavitation is a pressure-driven vaporization process. And what I'm showing you here is a, a classic image of what you would see in your thermodynamics textbooks where you have a pressure versus temperature in, of, of, for liquid or for water, and you see the, the three different phases here, solid, liquid, and vapor. And if you were to start at, let's say, one megapascal for liquid at 100 C, uh, you would be in the liquid phase. And as you lower the, the, the temperature, I'm sorry, the pressure, uh, while keeping the temperature constant, you will see that you would go from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. Now, how could you achieve this uh, hydrodynamically? Well, when, uh, whenever the flow has to accelerate, it ultimately reduces its pressure. And one way that it can do this is if it's traversing over an obstacle, say, for example, a hydrofoil, as I show here in the image on the right from Harish Ganesh and others, where you have this flow going from right to left, and it has to accelerate over this obstacle, this hydrofoil. And as a result, the, 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 the liquid vaporizes uh, due to the lowering of the pressure as it goes over the foil. And it always takes a form of these clouds, as we can see here. And these bubbles uh, begin to collapse near the surface and begin to erode the actual surface of, of the hydrofoil. And this can actually have uh, uh, devastating consequences in uh, many hydraulic and naval applications. As you can see here, a picture from Brandon 1994 of this, uh, uh, this water turbine, where you can see the propeller blades have been effectively eaten away by the bubbles and eaten away the metal. So there's four stages in which this cavitation uh, events happen, uh, specifically for metals. The first one being the small vapor structure formation, the bubble clouds that I showed in the previous slide, the impact loading from the bubble, co bubble collapses, and then the pitting and ultimately the failure of the, of the piece of equipment. It is the second phase, the second step here that's really hard to be able to determine and actually be able to predict, uh, specifically because of the nonlinear behavior in which these bubbles collapse near uh, these, uh, these solid objects. So the first thing to do is to really begin to understand how bubbles respond to their environment. And so here I just give you a quick image of a cartoon of a, of a bubble sitting in an infinite liquid of, of water. And the way that to think about this is if the pressure increases on the outside, the bubble responds by oscillating its volume, in this case, decreasing its volume. If the pressure in the outside is decreased, the bubble responds by growing its volume. And then there's a constitutive equation um, that actually governs this bubble motion that you can develop from theory. And uh, in the state of the art, uh, compressible multi-phase frameworks can actually simulate this inertially driven collapse that agrees well with the theory as I show here, the radius over time of these bubbles. And the blue here representing the actual theory result. And then the orange uh, diamonds here actually representing the results that we can get with our framework when solving these problems on machines like, for example, Blue Waters. Now, when these bubbles uh, collapse, uh, they can also happen in very extreme cases. They implode, and they emit what's called an outward propagating uh, shock wave, as shown here from the experiments from Sapone and others. And what we know about this shock wave is that when it propagates out radially, the pressure will decrease as 1 over r here, where r is that radial direction away from the bubble's uh, epicenter. And we can actually capture this phenomena in our simulations uh, when we're actually conducting full 3D uh, sims. Now, to actually begin to think about it even further, let's suppose that it's not an infinite liquid. Our problem is really seeing how bubbles collapse near surfaces. So let us imagine the case where we have this initial setup here where the bubbles achieve this maximum radius. So we have a low pressure relative to the outside, which there's a higher pressure that is going to drive the collapse. What we see is that the bubble will ultimately collapse asymmetrically due to the way that the pressure is oriented around the bubble. And as a result, the bubble will form what's called a reentrant jet, uh, forming here on the distal side relative to the wall, and then penetrating into the bubble and hitting the proximal side relative to the wall, and then leading to this water hammer uh, shock wave that we see here that then propagates towards the wall. That's actually less efficient had it, the bubble just collapsed pure, uh, perfectly uh, spherically. But, the, but ultimately, the shock wave then is guided directly towards the wall. Now, the question then becomes, can we predict what this impact load was uh, as a result of the initial conditions of this problem of this configuration? 
And so one of the, the works that uh, my colleague had actually done during the course of his PhD is to be able to see the appropriate scaling of the maximum pressures. Here, for example, the maximum pressure being the P max of the wall that you experience divided by the liquid density, the speed of sound of the liquid, and then this specific speed here that's known as the characteristic uh, uh, jet speed or the reentrant jet speed that goes as the initial conditions where the, the differences in the pressure divided by the density of the liquid, you can actually get a speed there. And so because of this, you can actually n normalize or do the appropriate scaling. You can see that for doing the scaling over all the cases for which the bubble, the distances at which the bubble collapsed, you can get all the data to collapse onto a single curve and allows us to actually be able to predict what the impact loads would be from a single bubble near a wall. But our, our major uh, point of interest here is to look at applications where it's not just a single bubble and, and there's not just one wall, but in many different situations. And there's a wide breadth of applications to actually carry this research even further. And here I'm only showing you two, the first of which being in energy science and the next one being in, in biomedicine. The first one here being in these uh, uh, spallation neutron source experiments uh, being taking place at the Oak Ridge National Lab where they actually uh, fire a proton beam onto a mercury vessel and out comes a neutron beam, beam that then they use for uh, diagnostics and actually being able to see very dense materials like car engines, for example. But when this process happens of this proton beam firing inside of this vessel, it ultimately leads to a very powerful pressure wave that leads to these bubbles taking, uh, manifesting themselves and cavitating as a result and then uh, eroding away and th this actually limits the actual kind of experiments and the power output they can produce from their neutron beams. And so it's a key, key interest to really understand what happens when these bubbles are collapsing in very confined environments. And likewise, in, in the biomedicine field, there's uh, pr procedures and, uh, and other similar tools called extra a corporeal shock relithotripsy, where they apply a very a strong pressure pulse here about 30 mega, megapascals, and then there's a low tensional wave. And what they've seen is that the, the very high pulse is very good for breaking up the, the very large stones, say for example, kidney stones, gallbladder stones, and the such. And that when it comes to the, the very low, the very small uh, fragments, the actual cavitation that occurs from this negative pressure is very good at breaking up the smaller stones. But the in-between, the intermediate region, you actually need both to get really effective stone common Minution. However, this mechanism, uh, that's kind of the description that the, the, the experimentalists have been able to find, but the, to actually understand the underlying mechanisms is still not well understood. And so our overall research objective is to really leverage high fidelity CFD with blue waters to understand the cavitation induced damage and erosion mechanisms in, near, in and near soft and rigid materials. And here I'm just going to show you uh, uh, the results from, uh, from three different studies, the nonlinear bubble-bubble interactions near a wall, so not just looking at a single bubble, but when two bubbles are close to each other. Uh, and then the effect of confinement, what happens when there's a single bubble and it's really trapped in, in a specific space. And then what happens when a bubble collapses uh, from a shock induced, this pressure wave, for example, the shock wave lithotripsy example I, gave, I showed you, uh, near a, a, an elastic object. In this particular case, that of, a, for example, a kidney stone that may be very large relative to the, the, the bubble size. So the way we go about this is to, to solve the uh, hyperbolic parabolic system of equations or multi-component uh, thermal Zener model. We're ultimately making sure we're solving the, the equations for conservation of mass, momentum balance, energy balance. And then we need additional evolution equations for the elastic component of the stresses and also the memory variables to account for viscoelasticity. elasticity. All of this is housed in an in-house high order solution, solution adaptive computational framework where we're ultimately having to be able to evolve the equations uh, in space and time. And we have to use high order accuracy to make sure that we maintain our interfaces as sharp as possible uh, to make sure that we can distinguish between uh, solids, liquids, and gases. So this is an entire fully coupled Eulerian framework where we can resolve all the phases or all the components uh, ranging again, like I said before, from gases, liquids, and solids. And then uh, we incorporate additional work that we've done, uh, both my colleague and I, during the course of our PhD to be able to resolve the discontinuous regions and actually solve this problem. And so then why blue waters? Well, uh, the high fidelity simulations really need a superior petascale performance. We need to run very large simulations, uh, more than 1 billion computational points for over more than 13 variables. Actually, the 13 variables is the, is the low end uh, of the variables that we need to solve and then evolve all of these over space and time and the simulations that could take uh, the, not only the full 48 hours, but also we need to run them multiple times in the case where we have to, you know, we, we save the last restart file then have to continue uh, the simulation even further into past 48 hours for each simulation case for us to fully resolve the actual problem and see the bubble collapsing near these objects. And we see that for the strong and weak scaling, we get very, very good uh, ideal 
well, a comparison with the ideal expectation for strong and weak scaling. Uh, and here I'm showing you the, the actual, I'm just going to put a little circle here that near the tail end here when we're actually, is the actual operational range for all the runs I'm showing you today, we don't actually run up here in this regime where we have low number of cores. We're always running in the 10 to the 4, if not 10 to the 5 number of cores for our simulations. And so then I'm going to circle back to this, again, the, the accomplishments um, as a result of our work. The nonlinear bubble interactions when these two bubbles are collapsing near a wall, uh, a lot of that work attributed to the, uh, the graduation in the, <laughs> of my colleague with his thesis, as well as two archive papers and two papers that he's currently preparing, and four conference talks and, 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 uh, that were national and international talks. And then the, uh, the work of, of, of my projects as well led to my thesis and my graduation. And then two archive papers, along with some others that are currently in preparation and three conference talks thus far uh, um, that, that we've contributed to this work. So here I'll just show you, the, the, again, the, the twin bubble interactions near a rigid wall. I have the following setup. I have these two bubbles, a secondary and a primary bubble, right? And then there, uh, there's a primary bubble is, is located at a, a position uh, H naught, or if you normalize this, as delta naught uh, from, the, from the wall. And then they're separated by a distance D naught. If you normalize it again, you actually get a gamma naught. And then they're, we're going to say that they're both twin bubbles, so they both have the same initial radius. The simulations here range from 1 to 2.5 billion points, again, for all 13 variables that we need to resolve. And then the bubbles are composed of water vapor and then the, the liquid surroundings. So let's get just a qualitative behavior of what we would see. Here I'm showing you the single bubble cases here on the left side, and then here I'm showing you the twin bubbles just for comparisons for this specific case of a 5 megapascal driving pressure. And what you see here is that the bubble begins to collapse in the single, in the, in the single bubble case uh, near the wall, in the direction towards the wall. And then you can see the impact load, the, the pressure is here that it's presenting. Up here, sorry, I should have told you, this is the density gradient magnitude that I'm presenting up here, just so you can see the shock waves and the actual bubble. And then later on, for the, for the, to the twin bubble cases, the, bu the secondary bubble collapses first and then, then emits its water hammer shock wave outwardly right around the time that the primary bubble is collapsing. And as a result, the bubble collapses emitting a shockwave towards the wall. And so as a result, we've been able to see that for farther bubble, uh, for the, the farther the bubbles are apart, it ultimately leads to higher maximum pressures and impact loads to the single wall. But what we're really interested in is how these, uh, 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 how, what is the overall impulse load that was introduced by the walls. And what we've seen is that it actually ends up being uh, the case that the closer bubbles being, being closer to the wall actually leads to a larger impulse load relative to the angles that we're looking at. And so as a scientific impact, we actually gain fundamental understanding of these uh, nonlinear bubble interactions and are hoping to further develop this into making uh, high fidelity bubble cloud models. I'll quickly show you here the, uh, what happens when you collapse a bubble near uh, in confinement or in a channel in the left and right wall cases in a very similar setup as I've shown before. And what we would expect is that the, the, when we look at this normalization of the pressure versus the standoff distances, that the, because those waves are still, uh, are still in, the, in the system, uh, they're going to decrease the overall pressure that the bubble experiences at this collapsing. As a result, we would expect that the offender uh, confinement would re decrease the actual pressures and the impact loads that we see along the walls. And we actually see that for this specific configuration where we move the bubble closer and closer to the left wall. We actually see that decrease here for these kinds of simulations. And then we ask ourselves, OK, what happens if you keep the bubble in the center and just keep the, bu the walls, just keep moving closer and closer to the bubble, uh, uh, just squeezing the bubble in the inside. And what we see is that we see a whole new different dynamic when we do this case, where we actually see a different kind of scaling occur. The reason for this is that we actually get a vertical reentrant jet. The bubble can't move in the right or left directions. And as a result, the reentrant jet gets formed in the vertical direction that then collapses the vortex rings, as you can see here in these images, and as a result, leading to a very di new different kind of scaling that we're seeing. Uh, as, as a result of the impact loss that can happen under extreme confinement and, and the, our ongoing efforts are to actually develop this scaling relationship to predict that kind of uh, impact load uh, and where that transition actually happens uh, for these kind of confined cases. I know I have very little time here, so I'll, I'll make sure to just quickly show you what happens when you collapse a bubble, uh, an air bubble, near a very uh, a stiff object, in this case, a, for example, a kidney stone, a spherical kidney stone. And our impressions are that the, the shock bubble interaction uh, ultimately shields the stone from experiencing the maximum tension that it would experience that ultimately could lead to the fracture of the stone relative to the case where you just have a shock wave interacting with a stone. And so that's exactly what I'm showing you here. I have the uh, pressure and the stresses, the shear stresses that we're seeing in the stone from a shock wave. You can barely see the shock wave here because our domain is, is already being maximized here is how large these simulations are interacting with the stone. You see this very deep blue here of this negative tensile stress that's being developed inside of the stone with just a shock and, uh, just a shock and stone interaction. When you actually have the bubble involved in the picture, and here's the bubble collapsing down here, 
you still see that negative tensile stress here, but instead of seeing the superficial one, this, this negative, this very deep blue pressure, uh, negative pressure here in the stone, you actually see it be decreased because the bubble had collapsed and it's now in, in uh, transmitting its uh, compressive wave into the stone. And as a result, what we see later on is that you don't develop these kinds of strong negative tensile stresses that could lead to the fracture when you actually have a very large stone. So what we're currently doing is, uh, in contributing to the field is being able to quantify these three regimes uh, to determine what is the most effective stone comminution in terms of what hap how large does the stone have to be such that the shock really dominates in breaking the stone, uh, what, ha what size the do we need when we look at the medium stones for there to be a synergy between the bubble and the shock interacting, and then how small is the bubble, does the stone have to be such that the bubble completely dominates the impacts and collapses. Uh, I don't know where I'm at in time. Um, I'm at zero, so I'll just leave you with the conclusions and I'm, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you.